Hey, what's up guys? Phoenix here, and this video is going to be another Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro Duel video. This time it is going to be some competitively oriented matches with Mermails, a very highly requested deck to be messing around with on this channel ever since I posted those combo tutorials on doing six card hand loops with Moulin Glace and Gumball for four. Basically, this is something that people have really wanted uh, me to do more in-depth stuff with, with like deck profiles or with more combo guides or with playing uh, with it on the channel and stuff like that. So this is something that I wanted to uh, to do for you guys to sort of let you guys know that I actually <laughs> listen to you at least a certain amount of what you want. But uh, basically, this is going to be some matches against Sky Striker, the uh, the boogeyman in the room, the quote unquote best deck after the 200th YCS weekend. Uh, across all of the events definitely the deck with the most representation and so I'm gonna try and get through this part of the video really quickly because we've got eight games for you for this video one of the matches ended up being a 2-0 victory for one of the decks so there was a third match that was played so there's eight total games with Mermails against Sky Striker and this is not my definitive build but this is the build that I've been having the most success and most fun with testing because it allows me to open up a lot more uh, you know universal siding patterns against things like with Red Reboot and Twin Twisters I'm not really a huge fan of Light of Seca builds I think they're way too all in way too all or nothing whereas Moray of Greed is like one of my favorite mulligan cards in the game uh, it really sort of helps reset your hands and actually you know benefits the deck a lot more than Light of Seca in my opinion because because Light of Seca, you draw two and mulligan one card, whereas a lot of times you draw weird hands of mishmashed cards where you need to put like two cards back, like, you know, uh, like a Lind and one of your nimble cards off of Angler or whatever. And so Light of Seca usually just doesn't get you far enough, as well as running Light of Seca means you don't get to run one for one, which is obviously a consistency booster, Soul Charge, which is obviously a power card, Reborn, and Called by the Graves to force your place through. So like this is this is the list that I've been having the most fun testing. I do have some Seca builds, but they do not perform nearly as well as this one does in testing. Maybe it's just the way that I play the deck that is causing that to be the case. Uh, but regardless. This is going to be some matches against Sky Striker, three matches in total, and let's jump straight into the first game so this video doesn't get too terribly long, shall we? Alright, so going into the first game, I get to start. I won Rock, Paper, Scissors for this match, and I open with 1 for 1, Megalo, Neptibus, Undyne Gun. So I just throw the 1 for 1 out there. If it gets ashed, that's fine. My play, my hand still has capable plays. Uh, in it and so this is really a game that I really like that it was the starting point for this video because a lot of people have been posting comments on those combo tutorials that I did saying well you could just not open Teus and like things like that is like Teus is not nearly the extent of what this deck is capable of doing you can easily open plays with Megalo and all this other sort of stuff it just requires more cards which is why I don't usually focus on it in combo tutorials they don't really lend themselves that well to combo tutorial videos because you're like you have to open Megalo plus Neptibus plus these two waters or any of these two waters or whatever it usually doesn't lend itself that well to uh, doing combo videos in that sort of light but as you see because the one for one went through I was able to save my normal summon I normal summon Undyne to send uh, Nimble Angler later which allowed me to you know really extend upon the play I'm able to Gumblar my opponent for four I already did a Moulin Glace but because of the fact that I linked away with the Moulin Glace, it skips my battle phase of this turn right here. So I'm not capable of doing anything except passing. But that's actually fine. I've grown to be a lot more complacent with that fact of your battle phase just getting skipped. Because usually it doesn't matter. Because your opponent's drawing to one card, usually. Very rarely will they have two cards. Um, but even if you want to mitigate that, uh, because you do the sphere play, you could easily... Uh, like, this is a play that I discovered you could do after I played these games for this video against this person but I found out that you could break your extra link and put the link Kribo in grave if you added another Neptibus to your hand somehow and somehow like kept it there um, if you have an access uh, if you have access to another Neptibus you're able to break your extra link put the Neptibus on the field and then link Kribo in their draw phase of the next turn and take that one card they draw out of their hand as well but so usually it doesn't matter usually the one card they draw it has to be something super specific and the only real deck that has a capability of coming back off of that one card is sky strikers if they draw into like ray for kagri for an engage that they, they were forced to discard or if they draw engage itself uh very few decks have like one card comeback plays that they could utilize in the face of your extra link especially if you haven't broken the extra link off of yourself but so, as you can see, I'm going second against Sky Striker. Now, there are three Widow Anchors set uh, and one set engage off multi roll, and I've got to play through Ash. So, you'd think that going second, this is not a very good uh, position for you to be in, which is partly true. Uh, but basically, 
I'm going to start playing my cards, start trying to bait out certain back rows. I know there's at least one Widow Anchor down there. Uh, so I just start targeting things that I know are not Widow Anchors. I want that engage gone because I don't want him to get free advantage if it comes back around to his turn and all that sort of stuff. So I just start throwing my cards into the mix, playing one for one, getting stuff going. And I get to a point where this Megalo that is negated still tributed off cards, so that's fine. And I attack in over his Shizuku, that brings back Ray. I've baited out two Widow Anchors. <laughs> and, and then I attack with my Mistar Boy into his Ray. He tags it into Kagari. And then when I do a replay with my Mistar Boy, he Widow Anchors it so it loses the attack boost and then dies, which was a really, really slick play. But so main phase two, I still have two level sevens on the field, so I'm able to make my Galaxy Tomahawk and I'm able to just start doing things. And now I know his hand contains an Engage and an Afterburner, because that's what he added back off of Kagari during my turn, during my battle phase. I know he has the Afterburner, and I know he had the Engage from the Shizuku last turn, but I've outed his entire board. So I end on the Unicorn and the Cerberus, because the Cerberus gives protection from Afterburner. And uh, and I have the, uh, the I believe it was Ash for the, uh, for the Engage. I think I was holding that. Can't remember exactly. But so going from here, Undyne into Neptibus, I'm off lethal by 100. Uh, I probably could have done something else to make it lethal, but I was very unsure. I didn't want to commit to it because, again, I don't know if he has any other card in his hand like an Ash Blossom, which, as you can see from the replay, he does have. Uh, so, like, I don't want to... I don't really want to commit too deeply, especially when I feel like I have very, very strict control over this game, especially since he had the Desires twice, uh, which was really just a problem for him, was the Desires... The second Desires being drawn off the top when he needed literally anything else, like an Engage or something to get going, was a really big problem. The Jamming Wave and Afterburner literally was doing nothing. But so, that was a 2-0 victory match for me. Now, going into the next match, my opponent wins Rock, Paper, Scissors, and in Game 1, he gets to start. So... Opening with, you know, sort of a standard Sky Striker, you know, nonsense, you know, Area Zero, Multi-Roll, Ray, Kagari, Multi-Roll, Setting Cards, uh, and all sorts of stuff. So I know there's at least some Widow Anchors set, but I know the two outside cards were set off Multi-Roll and they are not Widow Anchors. So I know he searched a Widow Anchor during the turn, so the two middle sets are probably, at least one of them is the, at least one of them is the Widow Anchor. And I can't remember if I had knowledge of it being two Widow Anchors or not. But so I'm playing around... Ash here, because dropping the Megalo first instead of one for one is just correct in this instance, especially since it's a Dragoons and a Nimble Angler. And so, the Nimble Angler attempts to get Ashed, I call by the Grave, uh, and basically I'm just trying to bait out cards, and then I get to commit with the one for one. So, we just, we want to play things in that way, right? You just want to play things in that specific order and way. You just want to bait out cards for max value with this deck. So that's, that's sort of the mindset that I've been playing this uh, matchup with, is just going for max value. So now what I've got here is I've got this Megalo that can attack twice, and I summon a Marksman back off of my Neptibus that I attributed for the Megalo to attack twice. And that's exactly game if he uh, if he doesn't summon anything with the Ray. If he went into Kagari, I would have beaten over it and it would have been over game. But so I'm able to just force game through through Widow Anchors. And that's something that I've been noticing in this matchup, is that Mermel seems to have a really good matchup against Widow Anchor, specifically. Like, if your opponent's not flipping Widow Anchor and taking your Neptibus on summon, uh, usually the Widow Anchors don't actually matter that much. But so, in this game, my opponent starts, uh, has a pretty weak opening hand. I also have a pretty weak opening hand. I Gamma Seal my opponent so they can't use their Sky Striker spells. Um, like, like I wouldn't say weak opening hand. My opponent had, like, an okay opening hand, getting into the multiple engages. But I'm able to shut them down with the Gamma Seal, even though I can't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> that's like a huge problem is that I gamma steal them, but I'm not able to capitalize. I've got multiple twin twisters and stuff like that. But so now here, this is a really cool play. I reveal for the Megalo, discarding the Marksman and the Dragoons. My opponent chains Mind Crush on the twin twister. I chain twin twister, discarding the Megalo, hitting the two other cards, and then the Marksman resolves hitting the last face down. So like that's a very Yu-Gi-Oh interaction, but unfortunately one of them was Shared Ride, uh, so I didn't feel comfortable committing into it. But so those engages have been locked down for several turns by this gamma seal. Finally, he top decks into one of his outs, which is the area zero, to get the Gamma Seal off of the field, and then just starts snowballing advantage over me. Not really something that I could uh, deal with or handle at this point. I'm down literally six cards, drawing for turn, drew a droll, sucks to suck to draw that card late, uh, but basically, um, it's, it's really nothing I can do about it. But so. Uh, I use the uh, Neptibus Widow Anchor so I don't get the search to hand because there's no need to take it because I've got so few cards. As long as you negate the search that it's adding to hand with its own effect, you're not really going to do anything there. 
And so I'm only able to make Link Karibo and pass, and unfortunately that's just not enough because my opponent is capable of just going into Unicorn, spinning it, and then attacking with Ray for game. So that was a very weird, weird game for game four. But so now we're going into game five, which is the last game in this second match. I get to start, I get to go first, and I open with Teus Dragoons, with Called by the Grave, with Amore of Greed as well. So if like those other waters weren't Teus or Dragoons, I could have tried to dig for it further. I really, really am a huge fan of Moray of Greed in this deck. I really think that it fixes a lot of the problems that the modern Mermel deck faces, especially when you're implementing things like the Nimble Engine and stuff to allow you to link spam a bit more. And another card I want to play is Salvage, actually. I actually do want to play Salvage. I might actually, weirdly enough, cut Aqua Spirit for Salvage because in conjunction with like Moray of Greed or with like your Megalostrat or whatever, like, if you resolve a Nimble Angler, you could, in theory, salvage the two Nimbles from Grave to your hand, put them back into your deck off Moray, draw three cards, and you're good from there. There's just a lot of salvage targets in this deck now, and so I kind of really want to play it. As well as it gets you closer to that, you know, magic number for Mooling Glacing your opponent if you're dropping Mooling Glace later in the combo sequence. Uh, so, it's one of those things that's just very interesting to me. Uh, I really like, like the idea of testing salvage again in 2018 in Mermails. Uh, but so from here, <laughs> I got to get the uh, last cards out of his hand with Gumblar uh, to burn him for 3k because of the fact that he Ash Blossomed me. Uh, so that means that he takes 3k because Gumblar has not one but two bonus effects. The bonus effect of extra linking uh, and discarding two just from your opponent's hand only was definitely, you know, good enough. But then it just burns for 3k, so you're that much closer to game. And so this game was actually weird. Uh, for some reason, I think Called by the Grave is bugged on Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro. As you saw, the Ash Blossom on the Engage got negated. My opponent top decked Engage for their one card for turn, and I didn't shotgun the Sphere because I have Ash in hand. The only card that he could have to make a comeback is Engage, or Desires, and I'll just Ash that, right? He played the Engage, I Ashed it, but my Ash was negated for some reason. Where there is literally no reason why it should be negated. So I think Called by the Grave on Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro is bugged, to where it permanently negates whatever you negated with Called by the Grave uh, for the remainder of the game. So, my opponent, in theory, if he was being a good sport, should have just scooped because I Ash Blossomed his Engage, but instead he's like, haha, no, fuck you, uh, we're gonna abuse this bug and we're gonna try and win. Uh, but luckily, like, even though I got really tilted and made some improper plays on my next turn, it was still fine for me because my opponent couldn't capitalize too much on it. But so. Next game, I won two matches with Mermails, by the way, against Sky Striker. One was a 2-0 and one was a 2-1. I think that this build specifically just operates really well against a standard Sky Striker list. Um, it just, it's, I, th I think Mermail in general operates well against this matchup just because it's very easy for you to put big things on the board, but unlike a deck like Blue Eyes where you do nothing with those big things, in the process of putting those big things on the field, you're like getting rid of Marksmans and stuff, so you're able to do uh, a bunch of stuff. But so here, I've opened with the Ibli. I should have given it to my opponent with Summon Sorcerer on Summon so that I could then spin it with uh, the Unicorn, but I didn't think about it and I just hit no on the Summon Sorceress because of instinct. But then I use Summon Sorceress on my uh, on my Galaxy Tomahawk to get the controller out of my deck, which is a nice little play that I love doing, which is also kind of a reason why I want to play... I kind of want to play two controller. Um, it's just one of those things where like sometimes you do that. Sometimes you just summon the controller out of your deck off Summon Sorceress off the Galaxy Tomahawk if you have a leftover monster on your field like I did because I had used the Nimble monster. So there was a Sunfish left over, which meant that I got to make Proxy Dragon before using my Galaxy Tomahawk, which meant that I got more value out of it. Even though the Galaxy Tomahawk was only summoning three tokens, it was still like a huge value play because the Proxy Dragon already was gonna it was gonna be made anyway. And having to not be made off the Galaxy Tomahawk tokens was huge. But so, the play still ended up working in my favor. But my opponent is starting to play out of it because of Engage and stuff like that. And so, it's uh, it's something that's uh, pretty, you know, you know, typical if your opponent's able to play out of it. But my opponent ashed me on turn one, which meant at a very critical point, which meant that I couldn't Moolin Glace. And that's why they even had the Engage in the first place. But because they kept, they kept me from dropping Moolin Glace, I had a battle phase. So... Instead of having to wait two turns to kill them, I could at least try to attack, but Widow Anchor taking my Megalo was a pretty big deterrent there to uh, to keep me from uh, from doing anything. And my opponent's slowly gathering resources back in the in the process of just playing their cards because Engage gets bonus cards, multi-roll is really fucking good, like all these different things. 
And so now here's a huge swing in momentum where my opponent just fully breaks through my board. A Widow Anchor taking uh, my Topologic Gumblar Dragon, chaining Hornet Drone to it so they can make Unicorn with it. Uh, and basically I'm just well and truly out of the game from here. <laughs> definitely, definitely just absolutely slaughtered. I went first. They ashed my Dragoon Search, so I couldn't drop Mooling Glace, uh, because at the point when I Firewall Bounced, I had 9 Waters in Grave, so I was only going to 6, which is another reason why I kind of want to test Salvage. You know, if you draw into that card, it sort of helps fix the numbers, uh, but still, regardless. Going into the next game, I get to go first because I lost game 2. I get to start. I start with Diva, which is in theory really strong, but it gets Gammoned. I Moray of Greed, trying to draw into anything that could help me, and I draw 1 for 1. Hell yeah, and it doesn't get ashed. Hell yeah. So now we're just in a super simple game state, because my opponent's hand wasn't even that great to begin with, but me mooling glacing the ray randomly out of their hand just made it pretty much unwinnable at this point. So I'm able to mooling glace the cards out of their hand, and have the megalo established on the field, sphere into lind, and then get the other megalo out, which means that basically I just have games sitting on board, and my opponent has really nothing they can do about it, because they can't take with Widow Anchor, because there's not three spells in Grave on activation unless they shotgun the call by the grave and then if they shotgun the call by the grave they don't get any value all that sort of stuff so that was a very simple very simple very straightforward game of Yu-Gi-Oh but that's just sort of the kind of games you tend to see with this deck against Sky Strikers it's very strange once you start establishing the big things on the field and taking away your opponents like one way to play like if you hit the engage or the ray out of your opponent's hand or like the starting play with Moolin Glaze, it's pretty much a wrap from there. You don't even really need to do the full Gumblar play if you just hit the right cards with Moolin Glacia straight out of the gate. Like if those two cards that you hit, if you hit like Area Zero when they were trying to do like an Area Zero play next turn or if you hit the Engage or if you hit the Ray, whatever, usually that's okay for you. You just, you get them. But so now from here, here's another completely straight, like straightforward game. My opponent has bricked going first and so I just get to kill them. Straight up, I just get to do a Megalo play to kill my opponent. I sided for going second, so I sided the Mizuchi in, and I get to just kill my opponent. I get to summon two Megalos, both of which get to attack twice. Technically, if you want to split hairs, I summoned three Megalos that could all attack twice, because I used the Megalo on the field to tribute, and he properly ogred that Megalo, but I was able to drop another Megalo and have still two that could attack twice, and then one had the equip on it. So, but so that's sort of like the games that get played out with this deck. It's very strange. It's very interesting. Like I said, it might just be the way that I play the deck, whereas every single interaction I think through and I try to get the most out of it in terms of playing around X card, or I know that this card is engaged, set off multi-roll, or I know that of these three cards, they are probably Widow Anchors, so I'm going to target different cards with my Marksmans and just bait the Widow Anchors naturally. Maybe it's just the way that I play against the deck, against Sky Strikers, but before I played a lot of this testing with this deck, I wanted to put Magical Midbreaker Field into the Mermel deck, but now, after a lot of the testing that I've done, I'm less likely to put those in. I just, I don't really see any sort of need because of the way the deck naturally can play through pure Sky Striker. Now the Alter Guys matchup, that could be a completely different story. I haven't tested that one too heavily, but I tested this deck against Goki, which is obviously just one of those things where it's like, ooh, who went first? Who gets to gumble our who? <laughs> but against Sky Striker, which is the quote unquote best deck, the deck seems to perform at least really well when you're trying to grind with them and out resource them as long as you are dealing with the right things if you are making sure to keep them from resolving engage and then outing their cards naturally or letting them out their own cards naturally it just seems to be that this mermel deck because of the way it functions of putting a big monster on the field and in the process of doing that discarding cards that either gain more cards or pop your opponent's cards in the form of popping their set Widow Anchors or popping their sets off multi rolls so they get no value and stuff like that, it just seems like it's really, really well positioned. And then, of course, you have the big blow your load go first play of Gumblaring them for four and Moolin Glacing two cards out of their hand. So there's a lot of things that are potential consideration factors for testing Mermail in this format coming up to YCS Niagara Falls going into Soul Fusion format. I really feel like this is a very strong rogue deck contender for the format 
probably just as strong as Burning Abyss is in terms of the way it functions. It just needs the right people to put time into it and the right person to play it, to play it in a way that allows you to get the most out of it. But anyway, that's it for this video. Sorry for being a bit longer, but maybe you guys like that. Who knows? Let me know in the comments down below. If you have a positive comment or a suggestion that you'd like to leave down below, feel free to do so. Like the video if you want to see more content like this, if you want to see more Mermail videos and stuff like that. And subscribe if you're new here and haven't already and want to see more awesome Yu-Gi-Oh! content. But if you want to catch my streams that happen semi-regularly, usually a couple times a week, head on over to the Twitch link that is in the description down below. Follow my Twitch page and just get notified when the live streams start. And also, if you want to join my channel's Discord server, where I also announce when I'm going to be live streaming and I chat on a daily basis, usually with the people there, as well as answer questions and stuff, link to the Discord is also in the description down below. But other than that, as I've already said, thanks for watching, thanks for your time as usual, guys, and take care. I'll see you in the next video.